there's a mystery, an enigma, there's a memory oh so slight. Hi everyone, I'm Judy Hansen, Senior Associate Artistic Director for Chicago Children's Choir, and my co-moderator tonight is Gabriella Alamana who is a member of our Voice of Chicago Singers Council. And we're thrilled that you could all join us tonight for our fireside chat with Grammy award-winning jazz vocalist extraordinaire, Kurt Elling, uh, who the New York Times has called the standout male vocalist of our time. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the artist that is in your midst tonight. Uh, 13 Grammy nominations, including Grammy Award for Vocal Jazz Album of the Year, dedicated to you, music of John Coltrane and Johnny Hartman. He's won the Downbeat Magazine's Critics and Fan Poll as Male Vocal of the Year 14 times in a row, including 2019. Uh, eight Jazz Journalist Association Awards for Male Singer of the Year, international awards such as Jazz FM, International Jazz Artist of the Year, and featured on the cover of this month's Jazz Times Magazine with jazz pianist Danilo Perez. And it's an amazing article, check it out. Uh, I just wanted to con conclude and uh, that this little bio with this amazing quote. Since the mid 1990s, no singer in jazz has been as daring, dynamic or interesting as Kurt Elling. With his soaring vocal flights, his edgy lyrics, and sense of being on a musical mission, he has come to embody the creative spirit in jazz. Please welcome Chicago's own Kurt Elling. Yay. Welcome, Kurt. Can you hear the roar roaring applause? Yes. <laughs> I, I, they should. They should also put in the uh, in the bio the rapidly aging Kurt Elling, <laughs> uh, Chicago's own rapidly aging jazz singer, something like. that. So it's tonight we're gonna those, get it's, not, it's nice of you to say all those things. I want to say uh, uh, the, the the young people that we have uh, checking in tonight are are really the the most important people in the room. And uh, to all of you who are here, thank you for wanting to check out uh, any portion of of what I've been up to. Um, but you are the future, um, and uh, I just try to sing in tune pretty well and I should probably get a different bio with a, some less stuff on there because it's kind of gross to listen to. Oh no, we always like to hear it. You've worked hard. So Gabby's going to start us out tonight with our first question. Gabby. Gabby's hiding. She was just here. Oh, there she know. is. She's yes, hiding. Right. Here, Gabby, we got to get her unmuted. There she is. All right, sorry, I was changing to an attendee for a second. But uh, for our first question, um, when you were younger, you went to school for theology first, correct? And I did. I, I have a master's degree in, in theology, basically, yeah. Uh, now you're a very successful musician, obviously. Uh, what influenced you to start a career in music, and did you have any turning points in your life that led you to a musical path? Um, I'll say this by way of trying to make it as helpful an answer to people as I can. Uh, it's only after you've lived long enough to look over your shoulder and to have enough experience and to have um, just enough miles that you can say, oh, such and such a thing happened so that this other thing happened, so that I became this. When you're living through it, when you're in high school, uh, you know, there are millions and trillions more questions that need to, that, that haven't been answered. Um, and you're like, a, you're like a flower that doesn't even know what flower it is yet. Uh, and that can continue for quite a long time. Goodness, as they say, often suffers the longest awkward age. And Sure, now that I'm 52, I can look back and I can say, oh, well, when I was, uh, I don't know, 17, I was confused about these things. And I thought, oh, well, I'll be this, I'll be that. I had a teacher who 
told me I should go into the diplomatic corps. I had another teacher who suggested I, I be an actor. I had another teacher, who, I mean, I had several people tell me that I should be um, a minister in the church. Um, and so, yeah, there were many turning points, some of which were very painful. And I wanna tell you all the truth that there's a lot of pain um, in just existing. And high school can be whew, defeating. And you have to have a lot of resilience. Anybody who's gonna become something in this world is gonna be told no a hundred times, sometimes by some very important people. And if you really, really want a thing, or if you're really trying to discover a thing, or really trying to become something out of your life, there are gonna be people who are gonna be sent to challenge you and circumstances that are gonna to try to stand in your way. And so even the, the, this, this theology degree that I have, you know, I walked in there, I was already falling asleep in class a lot because I was sitting in in jazz clubs. Um, and also because the material was really getting away from me. I wanted to talk about poetry and I wanted to be inspired by things. And instead I was really being, hmm, just handed a bunch of material that wasn't really helpful to me. And I remember, you know, I was sitting in with, with Von Freeman, who was a great tenor saxophone player in Chicago. And, you know, he'd be like, oh, baby, sing another one. Come on, man, keep blowing. You know, get up and go again, baby, until three, four in the morning. And then I, I conflate the time, but, you know, um, the, uh, let's call it the next day or within the week. The professor at the university called me into his office and he said, yeah, Mr. Elling, I have read your paper several times and I have come to the conclusion that you don't know what you're talking about. And perhaps you should pursue some other line of inquiry which kind of showed me the door, which was a really painful kind of a transition because I was trying to live up to somebody else's expectations. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to blow out of a thing without being victorious over it. And yet sometimes if that thing isn't meant for you, it's going to show you that it's not for you. And that was the real turning point when I was out of school, I was heavy in debt, I was living in a hundred dollar a month room in some guy's house in Hyde Park. And I had a $500 car. And I, I just basically said, man, I've got nothing else to lose. I, I, I should, I got to give this jazz singing thing a shot because I've expended all my other avenues. And this is the, you know, like right now, if I'm ever going to try a thing, I'm going to do this. So I put everything I could into sitting in in clubs, getting work, playing for weddings, putting a band together. I went to Kinko's and made up a bunch of quotes about myself and took them around. And, you know, and somehow within two or three years, I was on Blue Note. And I had a record deal and I was touring and it was all because I gave every single particle of my energy to it because uh, I wanted it that much. And it's also because the other avenue told me clearly that it was not inviting me and that it was not for my skills and it was not for my aptitudes and my gifts. So you really want to find a stuff that matches what you really want to do anyway. You really want to, and for, and for that to happen, you have to know yourself well enough. And that's part of the issue. When you're your age, you might not even know yourself. What you might, you, sh sure, dreams, big dreams. I want to be on stage or I want to be the head of a corporation or I want to be this or that. Great. Pursue that stuff and, and figure out every answer that you, that you need to every question that confronts you. Um, and, 
some of that you won't be able to rush. You're just going to have to live through. So that's a really long answer, and I'm sorry for that. I hope it's a helpful one. I want to say, go easy on yourself, on the part of you that isn't growing as fast as you want it to. And go easy on yourself when you don't know the answer to a question. And go easy on yourself when you stumble. Don't beat yourself up about that stuff. You know, just be good and try to figure it out. And any questions that you have, you can find the answer to. Questions of meaning, questions of value, questions of who you belong to, where you belong. You just have to ask enough times. And you have to ask from your deepest self. And nobody can tell you what those answers are. You discover them by asking them again and again and again and again. And over time, like I said at the top of this answer, you will live into an answer of who you are and what you really wanted. Thank you, that was amazing. Such wisdom for our young people. I'm always interested to hear the amazing advice for our young people. Uh, I wanna congratulate you, Kurt, on your 25th anniversary year, it's this year. Huh. And May 23rd is coming up. It's the anniversary date of the first, uh, the release of your first record, Close Your Eyes. And Financial Times has called this newest recording a defi defining statement of his 25-year career. Can you talk broad broadly about how you have changed and evolved as an artist a little bit, if this is the defining moment? Uh, um, well, I, I can tell you this kind of thing. Um, when I listen back to my early recordings, what I hear is somebody with a lot of good intentions, somebody who has a certain natural ability that's very exciting and a lot of ideas, but somebody, uh, but, but, but also somebody who's just really young and unseasoned and um, unedited. There's a thing that you feel like when you're, when you're really young. And I think maybe it's because um, grown-ups haven't listened to you very much yet. You know, in the overall arc of your career of discovery and declarations, you know, you're young enough that you haven't made that many. And the way the people around you think of you is, oh, that's you know, uh, that's Kurt, but I would think of him as a five-year-old. I think of him as an eight-year-old. Oh, he's so, wow, I'm, I'm being, con but now they're being confronted by a significantly more mature intellect, self-regard. You know, you're having radically different experiences. You can go out on, you know, you can sneak out of the house and go places and get into all kinds of mischief and act, try to act like a grown up. Um, and more importantly, you can read heavy, important things and experience works of art and have your own opinions about them. And many of the people who are around you aren't used to hearing those opinions. And maybe those opinions aren't fully thought through. Maybe they're just your instinctive opinion. or Maybe they're um, maybe still they're borrowed. Maybe they're not yours yet. It's the same similar thing as before, growing into yourself. Um, where was the start of this question? I was really on a roll towards something. Just how you've changed and evolved. So over I've changed. So when I hear myself, what I hear, what I hear 25 years ago is somebody who's really in love with jazz, who should really have a responsible older person in the room saying, in the recording studio, saying, you know what, kid? I love what you're going for. And it's great. And you're heroic for wanting to do such and such a thing. But frankly, your technique 
singing technique is not advanced enough to, you don't want to put on, you, you should not want to put on display this particular aspect of your singing. It's not developed enough. You will serve the music better if the guitar player takes a solo and not you. You will serve the music better and your career better if you back off of that screechy sound or if you edit, maybe just take one chorus and not five, or if you such and such a thing, right? But I was in there just making it up. And so the lessons, uh, you can hear the lessons I needed to learn. That's what I hear when I look back. I hear all the lessons that I needed to learn to become this, and I heed them, and I try as much as I can in every recording project now, and I was doing it then too, you know, you try your hardest to make the music beautiful and you have an idea, but maybe you don't have all the tools and maybe you're not surrounded by exactly the right, I mean, yeah, I just, I hear a bunch of stuff where here I am 52, 25 years ago, I was in the studio and there was no, fixing anything and there was no um do another take i was deeply in debt and you know uh, it was just exciting and thrilling and go for it um and my 52 year old self says to that other self take it easy jack you this could be a lot better if you let somebody else take that spot right there and just you sing some real pretty now now this is not a this is not to disabuse you of the notion that you want to be fresh and have a unique sound and go down your own road. It's just to say some of the things that you're trying to play, you can't actually play. So until you, when you can play those, we should get those on record. But in as much as you can't play that yet, you should lay off. That's the kind of thing that I hear. Great, Great advice. Gabby, love that. Um, obviously, being a musician takes a lot of work, emotion, and practice, right? So, what inspired you to have a consistent practice schedule, and did you have any emotional burdens on your way? What inspired me to be uh, to have my practice thing together was that I didn't really know what I was doing, and I really and I, I had and I had gigs lined up before I had technique and a show to go with it. Um, I would, in those days, because of the people I listened to, and a lot of these people you can listen to um, online. So John Hendricks, J-O-N Hendricks, um, Andy Bay, B-E-Y, Andy Bay. Um, or even like a Sinatra, Sammy Davis Jr. You know, these people, they had things to say in between their songs. They had a, what they call stage patter. They had a professional way of leading an audience through an evening. And even that part of it, I realized I didn't have. Now you get, to, you get yourself to Juilliard these days and what they'll tell you in Juilliard that, that you need to do is they give you kind of a starter set. They say, talk about the composers of the piece, what year it was composed, maybe if it was made for a, um, a musical, who recorded it first or who turned you on to it or that kind of a thing. Talk about the piece itself. We're gonna now play a piece from Hoagie Carmichael written in 1960 and uh, was first recorded by so-and-so in a movie this. Thank you. For okay, that's fine. It's fine for a starter set, but it's, it's not really entertaining to an audience. It's more like a lecture to an audience. And what I discovered was an audience really wants to be led through an experience that is seamless and that is emotional. So if you're gonna tell a story, you need to tell a story that is gonna lead people into the next song, but it should be personal or it should be a joke or it should be something that is really addressing them. Most people, aren't, they're not going to listen to the names of the, oh, Rodgers and Hammerstein, uh, blah, 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 blah. 
it's important to, to know it. It's important to say it sometimes, but to say it in such a context of a way. So I'm sorry, this, this, isn't, this, is, this doesn't seem like it's addressing your question about practicing. It just, it's a way for me to talk about how much there is to be known even about the extracurricular elements of music presentation, let alone what's a mixolydian scale and how does it apply to these chord changes? What was Miles Davis playing on this solo? What is that interval? Why did he play that interval there? Why does it sound so wrong and so great at the same time? What's, why does this singer take an experiment and it just sounds wrong. And this singer over here in the same song in a different recording made five years earlier sounds right, but it's also not the original melody that the composer wrote. Those are the kinds of questions. That's as much practicing as any technical aspect, warming up your voice, singing the song you're gonna sing. That's all important and uh, and obviously necessary, but the exploration of music is so much a part of the career of any working musician. W it, no, to 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 you 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 find yourself you want to understand why things are the way they are. Why does again? Why does why does that note? Why that note is not correct, but it sounds so great. Can I use that note? in that chord myself. Now you have a reason to rehearse again because you have to put that note into your muscle memory of your voice so that you can reproduce it when it gets to that space and be very accurate with your intonation and with your breath support and with everything that goes along with it and telling a story. I'm talking about improvisational things at this point which maybe some of your some of our young people are doing and, and maybe not so much. I know that it plays a, heavy, a heavier role in the gospel tradition than it does in a lot of other traditions. So there's a little bit more room to maneuver there. But my, you know, as a jazz singer, it's a very, very big part of what I do. Every night I'm supposed to be singing in a, at least a slightly different way, an incrementally different way. I'm supposed to be recreating something, recasting something in a way that I and perhaps no one has ever sung it before. Well, that's a tall order. I have a lot of study to do. <laughs> yeah, you got some questions from our, our audience? Yeah, from our Q&A, uh, VOC member Lulu Ruggiero uh, is asking, what did winning a Grammy mean to you? Did it reaffirm what you already know about yourself or was it an ex or was it the external approval that changed your perspective on your career? Uh, hi, Lulu. That's a really good question. Um, it's a funny thing about awards and, and shiny things. Um, they signify as much or as little as you want to make them signify for yourself. Some of my favorite writers have told me explicitly through their books that a poet knows when the poem is right. The poet, the writer of music, the singer of songs, you listen back, you read back, and you say, that's what I meant. It's said the way that I want to say it. Nobody else has to approve or disapprove of any of this. Because the poet, the singer, is going to hear if it's really a poet, if it's really a singer, that person is going to have a wealth of information or a growing amount of information about other songs, other singers, other poems, other poets, other pieces of writing, other works of literature, other significant artistic events. And the artistic event that here comes the little soul into the world and wants to sing a song. And that singer, if it's an honest occasion, that singer is gonna stack whatever he or she is doing up against the greatest things that that singer has ever heard. 
And if it fits into there and it sounds like who they really are and it says it as beautifully as they can, then that's it. And anybody saying it's great, it's not great, it's great, it's not great, that's ego. That's a different area of thought and consideration than the private heart hearing the truth. So did winning a Grammy make me feel really good? It made me feel really good. And it was a relief because I had been, you know, nominated nine or 10 times before that, and I did not win. And that played a heavy role too. Maybe I wouldn't have valued it as much if I'd have gotten it the first time out. Oh, Grammy, oh, I can get one of those anytime. <laughs> but here it was, so many records and so many tries to make something, you know, you want, the thing that you make to be heard. You want to be heard. And you want people to value that thing that you made, that you worked hard on. And for better or worse, uh, it's very easy to get mm, seduced by awards things. I try very much, I, I, don't, I guess I don't have to try as much these days because I, I, my expectations have changed a lot. When you're young, you're shooting for the moon and you ought to. Because if you don't shoot for the moon, you're never gonna leave the atmosphere at all, whether you get to the moon or not, right? You should just aim just absolutely as high as you can possibly go. You gotta do it. Now I'm 52, you know, I'm never gonna be like a Jay-Z. I'm never gonna be, <sighs> there's a million people I'm not gonna make it like in terms of commerce, in terms of recognition, in terms of whatever, however you wanna define success. What I'm gonna make it as successful for me is I get to sing I, I make my own mistakes. I make, I make the call. I have the people in the band I love and I respect and I sing as well as I can. I'm doing the best that I can. It's not gonna be perfect. Maybe it's not meant to be perfect. Maybe the definition of perfect is crazy. Um, but I'm doing okay. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm 25 years in with my wife at this point, and we got two beautiful kids. And I, there's a million musical things I wish I could do, but I wish I could do them for musical reasons, not because I want to win another flashy thing, you know? It would be such a reward for me to hear myself really sing to the actual best of my ability. And I better get to it because I'm not getting younger. And at a certain point, the voice is going to start to give out and stuff like that. And man, if that would be the real loss. Not that I didn't win a Grammy or did win a Grammy or whatever. The real loss would be, did I sing the song God put me here to sing? And did I sing it with as much beauty and, you know, with my whole heart and with did I learn every lesson? Did I listen to every teacher? Did I, did I embrace every obstacle? Did I, that's the way you define your thing. Did you really, really sing as well as you really, really could have sung? It's beautiful. That was beautiful. Yeah. I think that um, we're going to need to close out here. Um, I want to thank you so much for being with us tonight and uh, for the beauty that you bring to the world, to all of us. It means the world to all of our singers here. And this is a difficult time for us. And I just wanted to know if you might just close out with a, a few notes from your heart. Yeah, sure. I wish I could play piano better, but I can't. Um, 
But I got a real pretty thing I thought of this afternoon. So uh, for all of you and for everybody sticking it out, um, stay safe. We need you. Keep singing. We need to hear you. Uh, keep studying. We need to know what you know, what you find out. Um, you know, just keep on. The whole world needs you. It doesn't know it. It's messed up with a capital F, but it needs you more than ever, more than ever. So, um, the second star to the right shines in the night for you to tell you that the dream you have really can come true. The second star to the right shines with a light so rare. And if it's never land you need, its light will lead you there. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, so I know where you are. Waiting in the sky above, send us to the land we dream of. And when our journey is through, each time we say goodnight, we can thank the lucky star that shines the second to the right. That was beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you everyone for being with us tonight. Love you, Kurt. Love you too, hon. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>